Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. This episode is part two of our conversation with Jeff Daggett, founder and CEO of Eyes On. As a refresher, Eyes On is a brand and retail development and management company offering brand, retail, hospitality, and licensing management services and representation in Japan and the United States. Since 2002, Eyes On has assisted a number of big name retail brands such as Apple, Columbia Sportswear, Nordstrom, Shinjuku Takano, and NBC Universal. Jeff's background includes over three decades of experience leading global companies in the Asia Pacific, specifically in investment banking, real estate, retail operations, merchandising, marketing, and general management. We continue the conversation discussing Jeff's time leading Disney in Japan, growing Baroque Japan Limited, discussing the common mistakes made in Japan by foreign companies, how COVID impacted the Japanese retail market, technology-related trends that will shape Japan over the next decade, and wrapped it up talking about Jeff's personal venture into the world of olive oil as one of the co-founders of Green Valley Olive. Enjoy. Going forward, I had the opportunity to work with Apple. My first work as I zone for Apple was putting in what they called Apple Solution Consultants. Our big electronics, big box retailers here, like say Best Buy in the US, are Yodobashi Camera, Big Camera, and Apple had sales floors there. But the individuals on those floors were kind of provided on a semi or part time basis by the big box retailers. Tim Cook's team, at the time, Tim Cook was head of operations, sales reported to him. What they'd found in the US was that if Apple had its own people there, Folks were getting better advice and it was easier for them to sell. That led to an opportunity in the very early days to do a little bit of consulting with Apple and Cupertino on coming to Japan. They had done a consulting round with another firm that told them that to succeed in Japan, they would have to change everything. We said, yes, Japan is a different place, but what Japan is really looking from you is your authenticity. And for anyone who knows Steve Jobs, they were never going to change anything anyway. So I cannot take any credit for this, but they came in exactly as Apple. And it's been great to kind of see them go on. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half of the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market that no globally minded organization should ignore. But entering markets like China, Japan, or Southeast Asia is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. However, times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success growing their key markets in APAC. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies grow in the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful Asia market entry and growth strategies by interviewing the experts who've done it before and truly understand what it takes to be successful in the region. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation. Brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. After your experiences at Nike and Sephora, you moved on to Reebok, who was looking to launch their retail stores in Tokyo. However, you faced some significant challenges with the customer base. What was that experience like and what did you learn from it? A lot of my colleagues from Nike later found themselves at Reebok. So I had this opportunity to once again work with some, some people that I really enjoyed working with. They wanted someone to help them start a retail story for them as well. So um, I got a a group of investors together and we opened uh, Reebok's uh, first store in, in Harajuku. At the time, Reebok was already as a brand aging a little bit. And by the way, that is not a negative in Japan because all the customer base in general in Japan is aged, but even so it was still really important to try to reposition the brand for a younger consumer. And another reason for opening the store in Harajuku was that was to kind of be the pointy edge of that. Um, but um, we, we, we quickly realized, and uh, I should have realized earlier, but it, it, it took the experience of opening the store to, to discover fully that our our 40 something customer base wasn't really large enough to support that store footprint or more importantly, the store footprint we had envisioned. We wanted to open more stores, Adidas bought Reebok. uh, And so um, the opportunity to further invest and get further uh, support from from Reebok also went away, uh, and so unfortunately we had to we had to close that store. So not every store opening uh, ends in a in a happy story. I mean, it sounds like you faced a lot of uncontrollable circumstances. This is this is true, and 
you know, and, and also you know, the, the other thing I think uh, that, that, that all of us working on that project learned was uh, corporate cultures matter a lot. Uh, Nike has uh, and continues to have a very can-do um, corporate spirit, and 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 Reebok too is a great company and a and a great brand. But um, this is from the outside now, and I've never worked for Reebok, but I would characterize it as is is more careful. And then definitely after Adidas acquired them, they would just work in a place to um, doing so that the the corporate cultures or the operating systems that the folks that we work with in these businesses or that we actually go into, you know, that, that company operating system, best intentions aside, really drives a lot of what we can actually do with strategy or, or, you know, anything else we do. So that was one of the big learnings that, that I got is how important in, and by the way, I want to be clear, there's no right or wrong corporate culture. Every corporate culture I've, I've also discovered over time is evolved to be right for that entity. Uh, you know, later in life, I've discovered, you know, I worked for Disney, which on the media side has a very, for a very good reason, a very controlling corporate culture to make clear that this is a positive thing in a, um, in a kind of lockdown, everyone knows what's next kind of, kind of way. Whereas someplace when I was at NBC Universal, it's kind of more the big tent. You've got, you know, Steven Spielberg works on a lot and you absolutely want to pay attention to what he wants and needs. And so there's, you know, there's different levels of how a company or a business will go about controlling. So coming back to the Reebok example, things that might have made sense for how we were doing work at Nike did not translate exactly to how they could, they could be done within the, the, the context of, of Reebok. And that was an opportunity for me to learn that. Despite the challenges out of your control, anything that you feel like you, you yourself could have done differently, perceived differently, operationally process management wise done differently? Merchandise was great. So in in hindsight, what I should have done was uh, get, you know, a larger marketing. Were I able to have done it? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I could have, but getting a, get a larger marketing commitment from Reebok in writing such that when it was acquired, Reebok could say, well, you know, Adidas, we, we understand what you want to do now, having come in and wanting to, you know, you know, control expenses and whatnot. But we're right in the middle of, of you know, trying to reposition the, the brand here. And we've made these these commitments. Um, I didn't secure that. Um, I was working with individuals that I believe, you know, I didn't need that with. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I could have done better homework and have discovered that even if I had 20 or 30 stores, this, this, you know, the, the work of repositioning, you know, I always, you know, respect like clockwork brand, like LVMH every maybe 10 or 20 years, um, they will, you know, bring in a new creative director and they will completely, uh, re message and the, 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 the models that they use will, will completely change and they will completely reposition um, that, that brand for, uh, for a new generation. And it's, it, they're clear about it. They take the time to do that, but it takes a lot of work. And um, uh, although we were trying to do that uh, at, uh, at, at, at Reebok, I really should have spent a lot more time studying what that would have taken and uh, not that, well, we'll open a store and it's going to be great. And then we're going to open three more and, and then it's really going to be great. Uh, so I, I'd say probably a lack of homework on my part and more, more homework, more, more commitment to the energy that it was going to take to get that, get that repositioning done, I think would have made a difference. Six years at Disney, VP of Consumer Products. And that catalog of IP and products from Disney, it was funny when you were talking uh, previously about you know, having a measure of control and my background in China, I thought, you know what? I really can't think of a brand that has been had more trademark infringement around the world than than Disney. Yep. So I thought maybe you were potentially even going to go into that, but definitely can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Um, I mean, how does one control yeah. or manage, if at all, you even bother? Does it? It does it need to be addressed. It it does, but it's really something that you you chip away at. And I was fortunate to be working in Japan. Disney first opened in Japan in 1959, so it had been here already for a while. It had the benefit in Japan is is it over time has come to benefit in China, and over time will continue to benefit in in India. We kind of see this 
rolling understanding of what uh, intellectual property is and what it means. And generally speaking, is each market has its own intellectual property that it needs, it needs to protect. The systems for protecting everyone's intellectual property improves. I, I, I remember back when I was um, working for Gap, I spent one day with Den Fujita, who's the founder of uh, McDonald's Japan. Um, he's the primary inspiration for Masayoshi Son over at uh, SoftBank. And, and he, you know, he talked about the years he spent trying to get the Big Mac trademark away from the squatter that had it in Japan. So, you know, now we think of Japan as being buttoned down in terms of intellectual property, but it it had its frontier days as well with, you know, some love hotel. If I remember right, the apocryphal tale was some love hotel. Uh, for anyone not familiar with love ho what love hotels are, they're the small boutique hotels along the expressways where if one needs to stop for a day stay, you can Anyways, there was some one of these hotels had registered Hilton and Hilton Hotel struggled for quite a while to get its brand. So so um, now we think of Japan as being completely buttoned down and the problem territories are elsewhere. But um, each market goes through this. And I'm, I'm certain the U.S. was probably also the Wild West, you know, in terms of intellectual property back in the 20s and 30s. I wasn't around then, so I'd need someone who knows more than me to tell me for certain. But we all go through that evolution. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, you know, I mentioned before how Disney tends to be controlling. And again, I think it's a positive thing. And my, my story for why I think that is so is, um, when you learn Disney's history, uh, Walt Disney lost his first character. So he, he and Ubi works, his partner worked on Oswald, the lucky rabbit. Uh, and then his distributor took that character away from them, um, because they didn't, they didn't have the rights. And, um, whether that, you know, right legally or not, it was, you know, it, it seemed through all of the, the, you know, the stories that are told about that, uh, episode that it, you know, it was like, you know, losing a child and it was devastating. And, um, uh, you know, Disney was really, a, a two-person operation. Walt's older brother, uh, um, Roy Disney, um, you know, really managed the finances. And Walt also having, you know, we talked about failure, you know, and, and, the, and I would say the, the importance of failure. Disney at that point also had gone bankrupt, I think, twice. So, um, so Roy was. Like I, I'm an older brother, so I'm imagining Roy must have been super protective of Walt, just seeing his talent and and whatnot. And so, um, you know, when Mickey came along, they locked it down, and they locked everything down after that. And you know, that's the, you know, there it's a. And so I, I use the words lockdown positively. They lock down their IP. They're very uh, locked down financially, and I, I think those are all really important things and a part of that that culture that's necessary. So when they when they do see these IP um, in, infringements, um, you know, certainly as quickly as they can, they're chipping away at them and and trying to get their their IP portfolio, um, you know, sorted in each of their markets as best they can. So just a part of that DNA. That was a part of any IP holder's DNA, but I, you know, I, I, Disney is definitely methodical about it. In some of the research done before this episode to produce this episode, uh, we pulled out a little nugget of the phrase fish where the fish are. We wanted to ask you how that applies to your experience at Disney. Um, well, it's, it, it's one of my favorite phrases and I, I use it everywhere and how it applies to Disney was I started work, uh, in a para licensing for them, uh, in 2004 and, um, uh, we had exactly one, maybe two licensees that were sell that were that were developing merchandise for the adult market, but the majority of our licensees were doing children's wear, which is traditionally Disney's strongest uh, market. But we quickly realized that um, because of all of the wonderful work Disney had done, I previously mentioned they started here in 1959. They opened Tokyo Disneyland in, I want to say, uh, 1993. Um, uh, uh, 1983, sorry, 1983. Uh, so, so by the time I joined Disney on the licensing team, there are already three generations very familiar with and probably more than three generations, but, but three generations and grandparents, parents, and, and children who liked the characters and enjoyed 
you know, getting them a product. So, you know, without doing anything, anything to slow ourselves down in children's wear, we realized we had this huge opportunity in adult product. And uh, um, I had the good fortune to work with um, uh, leaders in the U.S. who understood what we wanted to do and were supportive of us because it would have been very easy to say we're Disney. We're going to stick to our lane. We're going to make, you know, we're going to make product for, you know, kids two to seven or, you know, two to 13 and, and be done with it. That's our sweet spot. Um, but as we brought opportunities, they were really good about saying, yeah, go for it. See, see if, if that will work. And we went from a situation where our children's business was, you know, over 90% of the business to a place where I think even today uh, for Disney and also for a lot of other IP holders uh, now too, they have character business, you know, characters that look like they are, well, and and are made for children. They're made for the, you know, the children that resides in the hearts of all of us, but 60% of Disney's business uh, in apparel now and, and accessories, footwear, home products now, um, is is uh yeah is adult uh and that would have been when i joined in 2004 that was i don't want to say it was unthinkable but it 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 certainly was there there was no structure for that so um you know in fishing where the fish were you know we discovered those older generations still you know had that child in them that had that great experience at, at Tokyo Disneyland or wherever it was and they were still primed to if you gave them a Mickey Mouse t-shirt with a slightly elevated design that you know was something that they could wear in public um they were all over that that and a pair of Nike's I've actually been to Disneyland in Tokyo uh just a fun fact um, awesome the lineups were incredible Yes. Of course, this was, I'm going to say this was like 1988, 89. Mm-hmm. So I think I was there from 8.30 a.m. Uh, till about 10 p.m. And I stood in lines for probably about eight hours of that day. You know, we're in the U.S. now, post-COVID, I think this is probably changing. And I hear the U.S. theme parks are starting to look like the Japan parks. But, you know, 10 years ago, a full day at a Disney World or a, a Disneyland might be 20, 30,000 people. In Japan, it's not full unless there's 55 thousand people in the park and you're waiting five hours for attraction. that's that's full for japan yeah yeah and i mean i lived in china when when the disney opened in shanghai as well um and i heard the stories and i said i'm never going (laughs) i get the novelty but i've been to it in anaheim and in orlando and i in tokyo and i just was not going to go and do that yeah well you have those options so that's and that's what i do too i try to go to orlando or anaheim Enough of the love fest for Disney, which I'm sure we all have. Moving on to Baroque. Baroque Japan. Yes. Baroque Japan Limited. Okay. Baroque Japan Limited. You were the chief strategy officer, a Japanese fashion retailer. And this is this is going to be an interesting one because you know we're reversing the the polarization here of the things that we talk about because one of the things that you did was you took the brand uh, brick and mortar uh, to the US did a pop-up store in New York City's meatpacking district. And although we usually talk about what it's like to, you know, and leverage our guest expertise on how to get into markets in in APAC, I do want to actually talk to you about what it was like for you to go the other way uh, across the pond in reverse. So tell us about uh, what you did, uh, why you did it, um, you know, what was effective, what wasn't, what you learned, all the things, if you don't mind. Opening the Mousy pop-up in Meatpacking District in New York was kind of a natural progression of what uh, the brands were already doing. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, um, Mousy is the flagship brand of this uh, Japanese apparel company called Baroque Japan Limited. Um, And uh, roughly speaking, young women's fashion is broken into Shibuya 109 fashion, brands that that predominantly started in a fashion building in Shibuya called Shibuya 109. That's just off that big scramble crossing that you see in all the 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 you know the the movies of Tokyo. Um, and then uh, in Harajuku, we have another big shopping building called uh, La Fere. And uh, Mousy is a solid Shibuya 109 brand. So um, uh, 
started there a lot of denim but japanese style denim a lot of ring spun stretched denim very fashionable for you know 20 something uh customer and then uh, and then the kind of the, the tops to go with that and so my introduction to 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 baroque was uh via disney um while i was at disney they were one of um our largest uh, licensees they did a lot of really cool mickey mouse t-shirts to go with all that cool denim uh and then i had the opportunity to join them uh uh, when they actually were at the at a time at, for a time they were looking at uh, listing on the Hong Kong St Hong Kong Stock Exchange, um, and uh, so I was hired to help them on on those tours. But along the way, we had the opportunity to um, uh, take uh, the brand to the U.S. And this is after they'd already opened in Taiwan. They had stores in Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, and uh, uh, mainland China. They had two um, uh, subsidiaries. Uh, um, uh, 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 Baroque uh, Shanghai Limited and uh, Baroque Beijing Limited and uh, ran the stores and all the places you would expect to find them in China, San Litun Village. And, and the, you know, the idea was, uh, you know, let's also, you know, demonstrate that we can, you know, do this by going to the U.S. No one will be surprised to hear that we had the same issues in reverse to go to the US. The sizes were too small. We had customers that would come in and struggle to get into 24 waist. Um, and, and, you know, we, we didn't have enough time to, you know, up spec a lot of the product for that pop up, sold a lot of tops. Um, but it was an amazing experience. Uh, the, the, the merchandising director um, at the time, Yamamoto san, was amazing to work with because he, you know, brought the DNA. We had uh, the the launch was really amazing. We had the opportunity to um, kind of do a hijack of of, of Fashion Week. Um, we dressed about. You know, this was back when the whole flash mob thing was was still just starting up, and we took uh, a large number of the models, uh, about thirty models, put them in Mao in Mousy merchandise, uh, had them had them just you know ride around to all the different kind of fashion week locations, get out of limos and walk around and take selfies, and it was it was a lot of fun. So brands can absolutely go the other way. There was still work that that needed to be done, and I think they've subsequently done that in terms of working out the spec and and that sort of thing. But Japan has its own uh, unique take on denim. And in, in some regards, you know, folks who are familiar with denim will know that, you know, the ring spun denim out of Okayama and that sort of thing. They've, um, you know, they've done some new and different things like stretch denim and that sort of thing. So that product was a lot of fun to introduce to uh, a U.S. customer. Right on. Okay. I want to move and thank you for that. Move on to Izon. Okay. Yep. Tell us what it is. I know, you know, we're helping brands go to market in Asia. Tell us a little bit about where it came from. And then let's start with from where you're sitting, dive into the major mistakes that you're seeing brands make in the Japanese market that really your positioning and, and your expertise and knowledge is, is really there to say, hey, these are the these are the mistakes a lot of brands are making. And here's why we're here. And here's how we're going to help you not make those same mistakes. IZON really started, uh, you know, I explained how we closed Sephora. While I was closing Sephora, um, it was becoming clear that Sephora was going to leave. But with the management team at Sephora Japan, we were looking for some way to preserve some form of uh, a more accessible uh, cosmetics business. So uh, on on our own, because there was a brief window where we thought it would be possible for us to continue the business, but not under the Sephora brand, because Sephora clearly wanted out. Uh, with my then marketing manager and a few other people, we came up with uh, um, a, a brand that was sufficiently vague that could possibly be used on, on such a format. And we came up with a, a color palette that was really based to kind of marry up, um, uh, you know, skincare and color. So the two company colors were really a foundation beige and an eyeshadow blue. Um, and that's 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 really where iZone comes from. But then, of course, that went away, and I got you know now I own a uh, a brand, a logo. I have a, a color story, and I'm looking for work. And I started a consulting company. I said, "What am I going to call it? I'm going to call it iZone." But now it means eyes on. That's that's what it means. That that was that was the the origin. And uh, so started at one of my first uh, uh, customers was uh, JPhone, which was. Uh, that had just been acquired by Vodafone and they were looking to rebrand. So I had an opportunity to uh, help them. They had gotten a quote from uh, 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 
a big advertising firm here, Dentsu, um, uh, that for, for 200 million, Dentsu would make sure that all 2000 stores got turned red. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, I came in with my, you know, store development background and, uh, you know, a really good, you know, store development team and said, you know, if we bid this out and we bid it out regionally, uh, we can save a lot of money. And so we were able to do that for them. Um, uh, you know, going forward, I had an opportunity to work with Apple. My first work uh, as I zone for Apple was uh, putting in what they called Apple Solution Consultants. I worked with a team that um, our big uh, uh, electronics, big box retailers here, like the like say Best Buy in the U.S., are Yodobashi Camera, Big Camera, and Apple had sales floors there, but um, uh, the individuals on those floors were uh, all kind of provided on a semi or part-time basis by the big box retailers uh, and what Apple had found uh, in uh, Tim Cook's team at the time Tim Cook was head of operations sales reported to him what they'd found in the US was that um, at the uh, uh, you know places like Comp USA or you know uh, at the time I guess Circuit City um, that if Apple had its own people there um, you know and then you know, the Apple polo shirt that, that folks were getting better advice and it was easier for them to, to sell. So uh, we did that program that led to an opportunity uh, in the very early days to um, do a little bit of consulting with Apple and Cupertino uh, on coming to Japan. They had done a consulting round with with another firm that told them that to succeed in Japan, they would have to change everything. And we said, yes, we went in and said, yes. Uh, Japan is a different place, but what Japan is really looking from you is your authenticity. And for anyone who knows Steve Jobs, they were never going to change anything anyway. So I cannot take any credit for this, but they came in exactly as Apple. Um, I, you know, obviously, I, you know, they brought in the kind of more the, the you know, the, the Japanese that customer service ethos of the, you know, the salesperson maybe being a little bit uh you know, closer to you in on the floor, so you can get a question answered quickly. Um, I, I, there's a, a general perception, I think, and I don't think this is exclusive to Japan and Asia, that um, uh, everyone is a little circumspect and quiet. But uh, I, I think most people will uh, agree with me that um, the, the customers in Asia, definitely in Japan, are very particular. They're very loud, um, and, and, and in Japan, the, the, the Japanese actually have a word for them, which is kind of funny. It's called heavy claimer. Um, um, heavy claimers are your asset. You listen to your heavy claimers, you accommodate them, and you come out with a business that you can take anywhere in the world. That's the, that's the advantage that the heavy claimer gives you. So you want to listen to your heavy claimers. Apple came and was Apple. And I, it just, a, just just briefly at the very beginning of that, but Apple knew exactly what they wanted to do. And and, and they didn't need much help to do it because they, they came in as Apple as they should. And it's been great to kind of see them go on. I had a chance to work with some great Japanese retailers. I think maybe Japan does some of the best and most beautiful fruit in the world. This will sound strange, but uh, in Japan, gift giving is incredibly important. And I, and I think this is also, you see this across Asia. So I don't think this is a Japan exclusive, but uh, there's a particular uh, store in, uh, in Shinjuku. There, there are two or three of these you know, multi-generational family owned um, stores that do uh, like fruit gift sets, just amazingly, uh, very expensive. Um, you know, a, a flat of 12 star strawberries, $80. But the first time you get a flat of these strawberries and you cut through them and there's not a bit of hollowness, they are solid fruit all the way through. And they're super sweet, melt in your mouth. You go, wait, but where I come from, there's a trade-off. You can either have a big strawberry or a delicious strawberry, but you can't have a big delicious strawberry. Well, they fixed that here. Um, so, um, you know, I had a chance to go with them. They were working on a rebranding. And so I worked with their team to um, uh, um, slightly update their logo. And, and I would say I was in the room and able to provide some suggestions, but really they, they really had a grasp of what the mission was. And I think they did a really great job on that. So along the way, I've had a chance to work both with Japanese brands, even just here for the Japanese market. I've had a chance to work with some uh, businesses that are you know, headed uh, to the U.S. and then coming here. Uh, in, in terms of uh, w you know, what's being missed or what mistakes are made or what the opportunities are, I'd say right now that the, maybe one of the things that's being missed is it's easy to look at Japan and its aging market. And it's definitely aging. And go, well, that's, that's not a consumer market. But coming back to 
the combination of fish where the fish are. Uh, and then the other thing is, is um, no matter where you go, you know, I think we all know this, but there's, there's no market cohort that's going to magically appear and we're going to sell to an all new market. We always have to be taking share from somewhere. And I'd say, don't shy away from that. If you have a superior product, compelling merchandise, attractively merchant, you know, attractively displayed and appropriately priced, um, you know, with your story and, uh, you know, with, with, you know, the needed marketing, you're absolutely going to be able to take share here. And it's still a huge market. You know, there's still almost a million babies being born every year. It's, it's, it's still a very large and influential market. So I'd say if you're not certain about whether to come to Japan or not, um, you know, Yes, right now we're going through this uh, uh, because of the interest rate differential um, a, a kind of a period with weaker yen. Um, so you might want to use this period of time to study the market. Um, but uh, I definitely say Japan is still a very uh, attractive uh, market. And particularly now, I, I'm working with a lot of uh, partners who, even with all of the challenges, want to be here because they find that when their product is uh, in, say, for example, a really influential retailer uh, like Bean, which is kind of like our Fred Siegel, or I know the, the Barney's is no longer with us in the U.S., but it has that kind of positioning. And so quite frequently, I'm talking with people who say, can, can you get us into beams? Um, I can't always. Um, they're, you know, they're very particular, but we've been successful. And in, uh, in beams has got this wonderful, their CEO, Stata San, I just super admire. He's got a real playful heart. They do amazing merchandising. Um, and there's always an opportunity to like to do a new collaboration or something different with them. Uh, they, they're great marketers themselves. They have a great store blog. So if you do something at Beams, everybody in Japan is going to see it. And you know, what we've also discovered is people outside of Japan pay a lot of attention to that too. So there's a, there's, there is a cachet of, um, you know, and I think Supreme benefit I and mean, Supreme recently was sold to VF for you know, a couple billion. And I think, you know, there's still a lot of that Japan streetwear authenticity or Japan authenticated product, you know, being able to, you know, do great work for you everywhere. So um, if you're thinking of coming to Japan, there's no wrong time. Uh, and definitely, you know, this is a good time to begin to study the market. I don't think the yen differential will last forever. Uh, I'm talking about the current exchange rate. So um, I, I definitely recommend people have, you know, take a, a close look at, at, at Japan uh, for a future uh, opportunity if they're not here yet. What about the impact of COVID? I mean, you know, over the last 30 months, yeah. what are the changes, the shifts, I don't think it'd be fair to say, like, what are the huge changes? Because uh, there just might not be any. But what have you noticed as an impact coming out of COVID that was temporary and ones that might be a little more tenured? I think like everywhere, the, you know, the first year was, you know, everyone kind of, you know, bunkered down. That was certainly the case with 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 me and my family and, and most others. But everyone is now out and about. I mean, to the point where it's, you know, it's on TV here every morning that uh, COVID, rates, COVID, rate, COVID rates are starting to pop back up. Uh, generally speaking, the way Japan has managed COVID is they've looked at available hospital beds and then they've kind of set their... Um, uh, the level of uh, lockdown accordingly. Uh, post World War II, the Japanese government does not have the ability to force people to stay in, so no one's permanently locked in. But they've advised uh, at different times where you know hospital beds are starting to be less available. You know they've they've set you know rules about you know what times restaurants have to close, and they've closed restaurants earlier, or have told you know restaurants not to serve alcohol. I think importantly, they haven't been able to force anyone to do that. And there were a, a few restaurants that continue to serve alcohol and just paid the fine. Uh, and uh, you know, but now things are more or less open. Really, we're just waiting for the company to open the country. Sorry, to open up company as a Freudian slip. Sometimes the countries run like a company or can feel like that. The the uh, the current administration, the Kishida administration, watched the Suga administration uh, struggle with with COVID, and um, I think one of the so the conventional wisdom is that COVID was one of the factors that that made uh, Suga maybe have to resign early. So Kishida is being very careful to not make that mistake. And so, and understand, this is my opinion. This is my reading of the situation. Uh, so he's been very careful to be seen to be not opening the country up too quickly. But we do have a general election 
today's July, so th- this month. And I, I, the consensus is that sometime after this general election, uh, where it can't immediately come back to uh, affect anyone <laughs> politically in the in 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 immediate voting, uh, is that things will be opened up a little bit more. So uh, yeah, uh, pack your bags and and buy tickets for August would be my advice. Well, or not. It's going to be hot. It is so hot here right now. Take advantage of the uh, exchange and that too. Yes, it's a great time to uh, if if you've had your eye on buying a company in Japan, it's a great time to do that or a, or a brand. Uh, and, and I, Japan has is really high debt, just like the U.S. and many other developed countries. But the difference is that most Japanese debt is held by the Japanese themselves, so there does seem to be less pressure on Japan's central bank to raise rates, and accordingly. There's still a chance that this differential between the U.S. and Japan interest rates, and therefore the downward pressure on the yen, could continue. This is not investment advice, uh, but um, uh, if, if you are planning a business, um, just by way of caution, I, I would think that the yen might continue to weaken. So just if you're hedging or planning anything, if you already have a business here, please uh, don't beat up your domestic team. They're still earning good money in yen. It just doesn't look as great when you put it in another currency. This too will change. But if you want to buy something here, this is the time. So, So in September and October, come for the fall colors and come shopping and make your restaurant bookings now because they'll all be full. Maybe a condo for, uh, for some Airbnb. There you go. Now we've uh, it's been great. We've um, we've seen a lot of folks coming from Hong Kong to uh, to 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 buy real estate again. Yeah, that will go. That's great. Last question with regards to maybe eyes on. Um, are there one or two technology trends, well, technologies or trends that you think might have a major impact on commerce in Japan over the next decade? You know, right now, I know it's trite. I know everyone is doing it, but the the whole trend towards everything as a service. Um, actually, my mm. my meeting this afternoon is with a with a company that that you know runs three PL, and they uh, they currently handle mango out of out of Spain. And I'm going to talk to them to see, like, you know, you know, what else we could do. This is a you know potential way of you know reducing costs and therefore making a, making you know prices even in the weaker yen yeah, still still attractive. Uh, won't be for for every brand. If you have um, you know a high end brand and you need to maintain your price point, you might want to wait out the the current uh, kind of weakness in the end. But so that's one of the areas is this is the continuing um, you know efficiencies that we're seeing in in how we manage supply chain, how we deliver product to the department stores. You know, a lot more digitalization, not just on e-commerce, but in the handling of paperwork. And I know these are these are global trends, so I apologize. I'm not giving you anything new that's kind of uh, uh, unique to Japan. And uh, I apologize for that. A lot of that has to do with the fact that, like like many of you, post COVID, I'm just getting out and meeting with people. So, for example, you know, me meeting with um, uh, these folks that that have this logistics as a service, if, if you will, uh, e-commerce business. This is, you know, my first time to actually meet them. You would think that I know everyone. The one thing I will be clear about is um, I don't consider myself an expert on Japan because every day customers are making a new, new decision about what what they want to buy. So I'm I'm with every other uh, listener and all of the wonderful hosts you've I've, or not hosts, I'm sorry, guests you've had. I've, I've learned mm. so much from your your podcast because of that, because things are, it, and it's a good thing, changing every day. So um, if if I get any updated information, I'll pass it along. But I'd say right now, it's what what we're seeing everywhere is the continued, uh, uh, you know, efficiencies in supply chain digitalization, and not just of the, you know, the end customer experience, but everything that goes, you know, into providing the product to the customer. That's why, you know, it gives us great, um, the horizon for this podcast is so far in the distance because everything keeps changing and it changes yeah. so fast now. Yes. You know, I, I don't even know how the McKinsey's of the world are going to be able to keep up and produce enough content that's relevant for a long enough period of time yep. to be able to keep doing it. So um, that's great. And thanks to guests like yourself as well for coming on and keeping everybody's finger on the pulse. Question for you before we go, um, tell us about Green Valley Olive. How'd you create this company? What is this company? Uh, what am I yeah. talking about that people have no idea yeah. then didn't yeah. know it was coming and where can listeners get some? So I, 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 I think I previously mentioned I'm from a little town called uh, Placerville. Um, I have a few friends who grow grapes, um, but I could never do that as well as them. I've always loved olive oil and going to Italy, I discovered they don't send the good stuff abroad. They keep it and consume it themselves. So um, I started growing olives making olive oil. Uh, and um, uh, what we offer that's kind of rare in the general olive oil 
world is we offer complete traceability. Um, all of our olive oil comes from specific groves. Uh, we um, uh, the, the the enemies of of olive oil are heat, um, time, light. Uh, the light bit gets uh, missed. So even though your olive oil comes in a beautiful green bottle, which does protect the olive oil from what we call photo oxidation and keeps it from getting rancid too soon, uh, olive oil, all oil, olive oil eventually gets rancid. So if you ever smell olive oil and it smells oily, yeah, that's you. You're an expert on oil. That's your expert system telling you that oil is probably not very delicious anymore. Mm. But um, that whole process can still accelerate in glass. So we package in a, um, a special steel. We still call it a bottle, but it's a, basically a, a special steel can made for us in Austria, perfect purpose built for uh, oil. Uh, for 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 high grade olive oil, and then um, traceability, protection against photo oxidation, and, and the carefulness with what we package. And then the the third thing is um, our package is also lighter than glass. So when I send to Japan, I can send four bottles for the carbon footprint of three glass bottles. Um, it's not a lot, but every every little bit uh, helps. So yeah, this is my hobby. Um, what we're really good at is the quality side. What I'm dreadful at, some of you will be understanding, and some of you. Uh, will eventually get to understand this. No matter how good one thinks one is at marketing, one could be really bad at it for themselves. So I'm a do as I say, don't do as I do. So, so we're great on the production side, but I really need to hire WPIC to help me with the marketing because I am just dreadful at it. My website needs work. I could I could go on with the list here, but I'll just stop there and say we like the product, but it, it needs a lot of work. And if any of you with any of your businesses out there can relate to that, well, yeah, that's isn't that business? That's life. How many authors out there that are just absolutely literary geniuses are held up being uh, best writing authors and not being best selling authors? Yeah. So it, it happens to the best of us. Uh, yeah. So choose your publishing house wisely, I guess, is the uh, takeaway. As we like to do now, we now we want to call out a couple of guest recommendations from you, get their name, get them voiced on on the show so that we can go to them and say, hey, Jeff threw you under the bus on a, <laughs> on a recent uh, episode. Now our audience is going to be really sad if, if you don't show up and, and do this thing. So who have you got for us? Um, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd say my, uh, colleague and uh, I'm going to use the Japanese word, but the senpai, we, senpai is our, no matter, um, what their age, if, 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 you know, if someone is a mentor to you, we'll use that word, like our senior teacher. Um, so, uh, Alan Wang, who's my, uh, uh, contemporary at uh, NBC universal. And we also work together at, uh, Disney. He, um, is currently head of, uh, consumer products licensing at uh, riot games in Shanghai, amazing person with amazing experience across Asia. I think he'd be really interesting, interesting to talk to. Okay. Um, I would say, uh, Lester Lee, who uh, was my colleague, uh, who ran apparel at Nike when I was working at Nike first in retail and then marketing. He also went on, I had the opportunity to work with him at Disney. And while he's now retired, he's back living in Shanghai and, uh, and also has great stories about, um, uh, when you're first starting a licensing business in China, what it actually takes to collect the royalty checks, um, uh, okay. and, 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 and other things, uh, uh, of course, times have changed. So, but uh, it, in his word, I don't want to steal his thunder. But uh, my recollection was it was a lot of golf. <laughs> it probably is. So, uh, so I, you know, I I mentioned those two, uh, and um, I, I I can definitely come up with others. But you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed about uh, this podcast is just so much it's taught me about China. So I apologize about once again suggesting a couple folks who know China, but both of those individuals know Japan really well as well. Uh, Alan speaks Japanese. Lester mm. lived in Japan for a long time. So, so in terms of just, you know, general Asian knowledge as well. That's okay. We're just, you know, we're spreading our wings here at the negotiation and wanting to, you know, uh, offer up alternate markets for, for others as well. You're right. I mean, we've, we've covered a ton of China and, and now we want to look at, you know, obviously getting into the other big markets over there, like Japan and Korea and Indonesia, Vietnam, other things like that. So this is how we go. So Jeff, thanks so much for coming on uh, the show. It was, it was amazing. Thank you for putting in so much work and giving us so much uh, information uh, for so long. I think these episodes are going to be amazing. Can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. 
Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking at the Asia Pacific region for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands, just like yours, enter China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation, and if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co, and be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.